Christianity. So today we are finish, uh, finally finishing up our sermon series over the risen Lord. Okay, so our last week in the sermon series, next week we will begin a new one. Um, and over the last seven weeks, we have been discussing the fact that Easter isn't something to celebrate on just one Sunday, right? It's something that should be celebrated every Sunday because that's the reason we come on Sunday. That's the reason we worship on Sunday is the fact that Jesus is risen, okay? Over the past six weeks, we've talked about the fear that came with resurrection, um, whether it be the guards that were uh, terrified um, or, or the disciples worrying about the Jewish leadership potentially coming after them. Um, we're talking about uh, Jesus showing up in the middle of the room and saying, you know what, I didn't mean for you to go hide behind a closed locked door. I meant for you to go and actually tell people all that you have learned, right? And then we talked about sometimes Jesus can be walking right with us through everything, but we're so focused on the issue or the goal or the problem or whatever it may be, we don't even see him because we don't look to the side. We don't look for him because we're so focused ahead as, the, the, uh, as we hear in the walk to Emmaus. Okay? And then uh, we, we, talk about, we talked about Thomas and his struggle with doubt and how he'll never live that down, right? He will always be doubting Thomas. And how he couldn't wrap around Amidst everything that happened, he still couldn't wrap around his head around the idea that nothing was impossible for Jesus. And then we talked about Peter and the true love that God had for him. He was at three times, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. The same, very symbolic of the three times Jesus had denied, or Jesus had been denied by him, right? Very symbolically. He asked him three times, well, if you do, that's fine. Don't just tell people about me. Take care of them like I would. And that brings us to this week, Pentecost. Before we go reading the scripture today, which is uh, uh, for the books of Acts, and I have it marked wrong. Uh, I gave it to Donna wrong. Um, it's Acts 2, 1 through 21. It's maybe one page different if, if it has a page number on there, so it'll be okay. Um, but I want us to, to be remembering uh, that, that we're going to be all the stuff that we had looked to and how we've gotten to this point. And I want to start off, like always, as a question to make sure that everybody's excited as we come forward. One of the things I'll never understand is... Pentecost, have we talked about what the three most attended days are, right? It's Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day, and then it's a drop-off. Dads, you have the worst attendance of the year. For Father's Day is the worst. It, just because it's Sunday, Father's Day does not mean go golfing. God still comes before golf. And remember that when you're out doing the tea and you have a slice Maybe Jesus was there, just saying. But uh, uh, one of the days that I don't get why we don't have big numbers is Pentecost. It's a big deal. It's the birth of the church. You just learned what the kids did. So if they remember and you don't, you're fired. Okay? No. Yes. But I did hear that you're going to bake cookies for everybody that gets it right. So that's great. Um, and we do have snacks, as always, after church. Now you can't get them unless you know. Well done. <laughs> has, uh, uh, it, it's something um, that is super exciting if, if we really think about it. But the question I want to ask this morning is there's other stuff we tend to to have. There's stuff that we get super excited for. Has anybody ever had something they get super, super excited for? And then it's a giant letdown. Okay? Right? There, there's just sometimes it's like, man, I want to go to this. I want to do this thing. It's going to be so awesome. And it's not. 
I'm not sure if there's a bigger culprit in the world of this to me than movies. Okay? Movies have always been my thing, okay? Um, and ask Mariah last time we went on a movie date because, like, her thing is going out to dinner. Mine has always been movies. We've gone out to dinner plenty, and we haven't been to the movies in a long time. Maybe that's my Father's Day gift. No, there's no good ones lately. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> um, but it's always been my thing. I, I've always enjoyed watching movies and, and, and doing these different things. I love to watch movies. Even, I mean, our family, honestly, every Friday night when it's not football season, we sit and we order pizza or we make something special and we watch a movie. Okay? Now you don't necessarily have to go because everything's on Paramount or uh, whatever, and it's way cheaper. I mean, let's be real. That's the real reason. It's 100 bucks to go to the movie theater. I can spend 10 and buy it on Apple. Okay? <laughs> Just way cheaper date. Um, but we sit down and watch this movie together. And from time to time, one of us picks one from our our streaming services, uh, one of our streaming services, and the movie's just not really good, and the kids don't ever make it to the end, but I'm somebody, even if it's terrible, I have to know the ending, okay? Um, I have to. But to me, there's no bigger culprit of that than the dreaded sequel. You know what I'm talking about. You do. So many movie franchises should just end after the first one. Okay, and they don't, they just go ahead and make another. Maybe the first one's great and people gather and, and they get this unrealistic expectation, right? It's like, oh my goodness, this next one's going to be even better. It's going to be awesome. And maybe, maybe in the sequel they couldn't get the same actors or, or, or whatever the case may be. The movie is awful. Want some examples? Everybody probably liked Jaws, right? Two was terrible. The shark blew up, man. Come on. What would you need a sequel for? Okay. Uh, uh, back to the Future, the, this one I get a pushback on. The first one was way better than the rest. I'm sorry. It just really was. Uh, uh, Sandlot. Sandlot 1. One of the greatest movies of all time. How many people like Sandlot 2? No, Sandlot 2. Yeah, no hands go up. See, exactly, don't. It's terrible, okay? There's all these absolutely terrible movies. And um, um, the, the one my friend brought up that was the business example, sometimes they wait years in between. Space Jam 1, awesome. Space Jam 2, no. It's just terrible. Somebody did, I think somebody just said Space Jam 2, there's a Space Jam 2. There's not. Just pretend it doesn't exist. It's better that way, okay? Because it ruins the first one. <laughs> but every time we, we, we think of this, we, we, we assume that it's going to be better. But don't get me wrong. Sometimes there's ones that surpass. Sometimes the sequel is better than the original. It doesn't happen a lot. And for those of you that were alive during these, because these, they're not that often, um, You'll have to let me know. One of the ones I heard that the, uh, um, was much bigger was the original Star Wars. The second and third got way better reviews than the first one did. Uh, that's what I was told. I don't know. Not that big of a Star Wars guy. I'll watch him. But I've heard they, they, the Return of the Jedi and whatever got, got so much better reviews. Um, and then there's things like the Harry Potter series. Okay, that one I watched. Those just kept getting more popular. Um, the Marvel ones kept getting more popular until the last one, now they're falling off. But it just depends. Okay, there's such discrepancies um, in these different things. So I'm always nervous for the sequel to see what's going to happen. How am I going to connect all this, right, to, to Scripture? That's where we're going to come. Jesus' life was so amazing. His ministry was so great. How could anything ever live up to the what's next? Right? How could anything ever be as glorious as, as Jesus' life? When Jesus ascended, what better could happen? 
well, story's over. This is great. Now let's leave. But that's not what happened, right? But I wonder what the disciples thought. Maybe they didn't know what was coming in the rest of the story, obviously. Maybe they didn't know if they could live up to the expectations that Jesus had put before them. Obviously, none of them were perfect. So maybe they were terrified. None of them was going to be Jesus. But there was a gift that was coming that was going to make all the difference in the world. Let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21 this morning as I try not to butcher the names of some of these places. Let's read. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven like a howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire uh, alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under the sun, or under heaven, living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all of the people who are speaking Galileans? Every one of them. How, then, can they speak how can each of us hear them speaking in our native tongues? Corinthians, Medes, Elamites, as well as the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, uh, Pontus, Asia, Pyregi Pyregia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the regions of Libya bordering Syria, and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs, were we hear the de uh, them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other eleven apostles. He raised his voice and declared, uh, Judeans... And everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will have visions your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. It will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above. And signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness and the moon will be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes, and everyone who calls on my name of or calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. <sighs> I'm just gonna again um, tell all of the the um, um, liturgists, you're welcome for not having to butcher those places and names and words anymore. <laughs> Pentecost is known, like I said, it's the birthday of the church. I don't get why it's not more celebrated. I just actually got done telling Donna before service. I'm like, Donna, I have to write down that next year this is going to have to have some kind of birthday theme or something uh, um, because we need to. We need to have it uh, uh, be that type of celebration because it is. The birth of a church is a big deal. Because it's when the Holy Spirit, the gift that 
Jesus had promised the disciples had finally arrived. And man, they didn't know how to make an entrance, right? It, it, it wasn't quiet. It was, it was a big deal. Coming with tongues of fire above the disciples as they speak, uh, spoke in so many different languages and that were present. Everyone could hear and understand what was being said. Can you imagine the powerful scene that would have been taking place there? All of these different people hearing the same gospel in their native dialect. See, Jesus entering into heaven isn't the end of the story. It was just the next chapter or sequel. Like we see throughout many scriptures, though, there are the doubters and the naysayers that will look for anything, any way to try and discredit something that God is doing. Okay? I almost think that's almost how you know God is at work is there's a bunch of people speaking against it. Because the enemy is not a, fr- if, if you aren't being tempted, if you aren't having issues and things come up, maybe you're not a threat to the enemy. Ooh. Do you ever think of that? Maybe if, if I'm not living right, the enemy doesn't care. <laughs> I'm not going to bug you. You're doing bad enough on your own. <laughs> Why am I going to mess with it? So they have the naysayers that try to discredit everything and say, these people must be drunk. I don't know how the people that are speaking in the multiple different languages are the ones that drunk. Wouldn't it be the people hearing it would be? Just saying. I don't know anybody that I've ever met that, that had a little bit too much fun and, and came up to me and all of a sudden was speaking multiple languages. Has anybody experienced that one? No? Okay. I don't get it. Maybe it's the time period. I don't know. But they're using anything to discredit what Peter is standing and addressing. And this is the biggest thing I think sometimes we overlook. The man who was terrified to admit to Jesus, or admit to the people that he was a follower of Jesus, the man who had just denied God three times, he was kind of a little bit of a chicken, right? (laughs) Get it, rooster crow? Okay. Dad jokes, just saying. They're great. Um... The chicken, or before the rooster crowed, he denied him three times. The same man is now standing in front of a group of people and calling them out for not believing. Hey, I'm going to recite scripture that all of you know, and now it's being fulfilled. Shut up and listen. Do you think he gained courage overnight? What did he gain? The Holy Spirit. That's all he needed. That filled him. That spirit was living inside him and now gave him the courage to stand up and say the things. He tells him what Joel says and says, your sons and daughters will prophesy, deal with it. Young men are going to see, young men are going to see visions. Old men are going to dream dreams. It's going to be amazing. Why are you acting like this isn't something you learned as a child? Acknowledge what's going on. The promises and the prophecies you've been waiting to be fulfilled have been. Can't you see Jesus dying and being raised from the dead was the capper. That was the final promise fulfilled until the Holy Spirit came. That was the true final. And that same Holy Spirit that came upon them and, and gave them the power to speak in tongues and, and uh, uh, um, that same Holy Spirit is available to anyone who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That same promise can be fulfilled in your own life if you just invite him in. Like I said at the beginning of the sermon, this isn't the end of the story. Pentecost doesn't 
make the book end. Okay? It doesn't mean that, that we have to go out and just, okay, now we've got to wait for the next sequel. Guess what? You are the next chapter. The only way the story ends up being a bust is if the only place you talk about it is in your pew. If this is the only place you come and gather, this is the only place you act like a Christian, then the story will fail. Then the story will be over. But if you leave and do as the, the disciples did, you, you have the same abilities they did. The disciples from that day left and they continued to, they went out healing people. They went out casting demons. They went out and grow God's kingdom, help overcome um, amazing things through the book of Acts. All types of things through the books of, book of Acts. It's one of the best reads at some point we're going to do a study as a church through it. And that, again, the most amazing thing is that we have that same ability. If we accept the Holy Spirit and give it the power and give it the authority to work in our lives and, and, and to speak to people, it will change things. That day when Peter stood up for the first time and declared who Jesus was in front of everybody, 3,000 people came to Christ. 3,000. Now, for some reason, we think it's a really big deal if we bring three people in three years to church. <laughs> has the Holy Spirit changed? Not rhetorical. Did, has the Holy Spirit changed? Okay, again, not rhetorical question. Has the Holy Spirit changed? Okay, has God changed? What's changed? Us. The disciples had the fear of death, the fear of persecution. Yes, Christians are still persecuted to this day. All you have to do is turn on the news and we're persecuted all the time. That's fine. You're not going to get murdered. Okay? Go out and tell people. The disciples had to be worried about being killed. We have no excuse. We know the freedom that comes from the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Quit sitting behind the locked doors and let people in. Amen?